Hi there and welcome from Ventura, California to today's webinar, Detection and Geolocation of GNSS Interference Sources, sponsored by Inside GNSS, Novatel and Inside Unmanned Systems, and hosted by WebAttract, the leader in thought leadership webinars. I'm Lori Dearman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be one of your moderators for today's session. And in just a moment, we'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they share their research and solutions. You'll also have an opportunity to have your question answered at midpoint and at the end of the presentation during our Ask the Expert panel session with all of our panelists today. Now, we've invited you along with over 500 professionals across 47 countries representing a variety of industries. And over the next 90 minutes, regardless of your industry segment, or your location, we're confident that you'll find today's webinar of value. Now, before we get started, Richard Fisher, publisher inside GNSS and inside Unmanned Systems, would like to take just a moment to welcome you and introduce our sponsor and main moderator for today. So over to you, Richard. Thanks so much, Lori. Um, on behalf of the Inside GNSS team, uh, I extend a warm welcome to our international audience for today's webinar. I would like to introduce uh, Dean Kemp, Defense Segment Manager uh, of Novatel. Dr. Kemp has over 20 years of academic, industrial, and business experience in engineering products and services. As Novatel's Defense Segment Manager, he's committed to precise, assured positioning and timing to address the needs of the NAVWAR professionals worldwide. Dr. Kemp. Thank you, Richard. Um, hello, welcome to this seminar. Over the course of the next hour or so, you will hear from experts on the impacts of interference on GNSS, including jamming and spoofing, and the methods of how to detect and locate this interference. Interference is a growing concern because it causes a loss of position, navigation, and timing information, or PNT. It is occurring with a growing regularity, so being able to find the sources of interference is becoming increasingly important. At Novatel, we design and manufacture equipment to help with the protection and detection of interference sources. Our proven GPS anti-jam technology, also known as Gadget, provides the ability to protect your equipment from jamming so that PNT is continuously available. Our OEM7 GNSS receivers, in addition to providing centimeter level positioning accuracy, are able to monitor and geolocate on interference sources. More details on how we do this at Novatel will be discussed later in the seminar. I'm really looking forward to the seminar, and I hope you are too. And with that, I'll pass you back to Richard. Thanks so much, Dean. Appreciate that. And now I'd like to introduce uh, our moderator for today. Uh, Alan Cameron is the editor-in-chief of Inside GNSS Magazine and the PNT editor for Inside Unmanned Systems Magazine. He's covered the GNSS, PNT industries, and research communities as a writer and magazine editor since 2000, focusing on technical issues around continuous, reliable positioning and navigation. We're delighted to have you today. Alan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, Lori. And thank you, Dean. And hello to everyone around the world. Buenos dias, bonjour, guten tag, buongiorno. And that about runs the extent of my ability to welcome you. I don't have 47 more or 43 more languages at my command, but it's wonderful to be here addressing an international audience. It's uh, very much like being at an international conference. Uh, we have a great panel for you today addressing one of the most pressing issues in the uh, positioning community, and that is jamming detecting it and dealing with it, locating it and dealing with it. And we'll hear from our three speakers. But first, we want to hear from you. And Lori, let's push out our first polling question. Absolutely. And uh, coming up on the screen is that first question. We'd uh, love to hear from each of you. How often have you personally encountered real-world GNSS jamming or spoofing in your work or application. And uh, choices there on the screen, uh, never, once, two to four times, or five times or more. So it looks like we have 37% uh, weighing in with never, 12% once, 25% in the two to four time range, and 25% saying five times or more. Uh, Alan, any thoughts on these responses? 
Yes, these are more or less, more or less, coming out as we expected. Richard and I had a discussion about this last night, and Richard was opining that the vast majority of people would say never. Uh, we do have a majority. I wouldn't call it vast, and we have a fairly healthy number of people who have encountered it uh, two to four times, uh, five times or more. Uh, just because you have not encountered spoofing yet does not mean it is a clear and present danger. And just because you are engaged in what may be viewed as a non-essential or non non-critical application does not mean that you could be influenced by uh, uh, and very severely affected by jamming at, uh, at your next door neighbor or someone in your vicinity who is engaged in something that may be targeted by spoofing. So this is a concern for everyone in the community and this, as I said, is a uh, pressing issue, uh, perhaps one of the hottest topics or certainly one and perhaps the hottest topic at international conferences that I've attended over the last couple of years. Uh, let's take a look at our panel again. Uh, very briefly, we've got Fabio Dovis from Politecnico di Torino, we've got Guy Bunnell from Spirant in the UK, and we have Paul Alves from Novatel. Our first speaker up is going to be Fabio. Fabio Dovis is an associate professor at the Department of Electronics and Telecommunications of Politecnico di Torino, where he coordinates the navigation signal analysis and simulation, that is to say the NAVSAS group, a joint research team of Politecnico di Torino and Lynx Foundation. His research interest covers many aspects related to satellite navigation and positioning, from the design of GPS and Galileo receivers to advanced signal processing for mitigation of multipath interference and spoofing detection and mitigation. He is also associated with the Italian Space Agency as representative in international committees discussing the evolution of the Galileo SatNav system. Fabio, please give us your presentation. Hello, everyone. Welcome, everyone, to this first part of the webinar. And uh, I, will, I would like to focus this first uh, part on a question on uh, how easy it is to interfere GNSS consumer devices. Because, of course, there's been, uh, as Alan said, a lot of talking in the past years about jamming and spoofing. And we know that it is a potential serious threat for GNSS. However, I would like to start from a quote from a paper of last year that was published inside GNSS, in which some friends were actually wondering if spoofing is uh, something that is uh, invisible or it's actually trivial, because we have this doubt uh, sometimes, speaking of uh, the how easy it is to interfere and actually to design and create a spoofer. And this is specifically, I think, a doubt uh, if we concern with consumer devices, because we know that uh, people with malicious intentions might spend a lot of effort in uh, creating jammers and spoofers if they want really to attack critical infrastructure or uh, uh, professional applications, let's say, treat them. But what about consumer devices? Uh, how realistic uh, it is to uh, think to a, a real risk for consumer devices like your smartphone or any other or consumer equipment. So uh, let's say let's try to define uh, how popular is jamming, and uh, we know that what we call personal privacy devices are indeed popular. Uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, I mean, sources that you can find easily uh, on the web uh, to purchase uh, jamming devices for GPS and GNSS bandwidth. And uh, if, you, as we saw in the poll, I mean, many people already experienced an interference event on their uh, GNSS device. Uh, in the picture that you see on the left, there is just a uh, a, a, an example of a, I mean, driving one day uh, over highways and road in the Netherlands, all the red spots that you see th there were uh, jammers, intentional 
and maybe also unintentional that affected the GNSS devices uh, that we had on the car driving there. So basically we know that jamming, it, it is indeed a reality and uh, it, uh, as we saw also from the poll. However, if we look at the spoofing and uh, we know that spoofing, if we look at the definition, uh, it's the uh, transmission of a set of false GNSS signals in order to take control of the target receiver. So uh, I would like to highlight uh, this uh, as the, let's say, what we mean by spoofing. It's not just the transmission of a mm, signal that, he, that being on the same bandwidth uh, as the GNSS signals is uh, disrupting your position, but really someone took control of your device. Uh, we know that this is, of course, very dangerous, uh, but how easy and how popular is to have this spoofing attack? Uh, we know that there are uh, different levels of spoofing that require different uh, also complexity in the hardware and the way the signals are generated and how consistent they are in time and phase with the signal coming from the satellites. Um, and so, uh, if we look at consumer devices, uh, let's say also in some way to consumer spoofers, so how popular they are. Uh, we know that, and we can easily find uh, cheap devices, cheap hardware that can be used to implement a spoofer. And you can even find on the web open source software that uh, is implementing the core of a spoofer device. Uh, we know that spoofing is fun, uh, especially for researchers, and I, I'm from, the, uh, from a university. We know that in academia, uh, we like to play with spoofing and of course to develop anti-spoofing techniques or detectors for spoofers. And I might say that sometimes I have the feeling that maybe we are overestimating you know, the risk of spoofers because anyway, uh, you need to be a PhD or to be an expert in GNSS uh, because to create a spoofer requires a, no a lot of knowledge. But also to use a spoofer requires a lot of knowledge that sometimes is not even available to you. Uh, like if you really want to take control of a device, you have also to guess or to force the target receiver to use the signals that you are broadcasting. And this is not really a piece of cake. Uh, in fact, uh, we know that this, there are spoofing events, uh, there have been, but if we don't consider very complex attacks that require advanced capabilities and also a lot of resources, or ad hoc scenarios that have been created uh, to show that actually spoofing is feasible, so they, will, they have been used for demonstration, or if we don't consider incidental spoofing, like uh, an event that is known to a lot of people that, I mean, due to a leakage from a cable, there were uh, GNSS signals spread out from a signal simulator, and they were acting as a spoofer, but in that sense, they were not intentionally not taking control of the devices, uh, I think that we should still investigate how likely it is to have an effective spoofer, spoofing of a mass market equipment like, for example, a smartphone. And also, we should also investigate how robust are, are such devices to the spoofing attacks. Well, first of all, if we look uh, even at our smartphone, uh, the GNSS part is only a small part of the location unit. And also there are, there are other sensors and also often this GNSS device is connected to the network, is getting assistance, is getting external information. And uh, this is in some way a point of possible point of failure, failure, but it's also a way through which this GNSS device might be robust to, to, to spoofing attacks. In fact, 
we will see this especially for smartphones. But I want to show you some examples starting from an example of those insurance boxes that might be uh, installed on a car and you get maybe a discount on the cost of your insurance uh, policy. Well, those boxes uh, are uh, in general made of a Genesis unit uh, and in an inertial system and uh, they are collecting the information, I mean, the position, the speed, uh, and uh, the acceleration uh, in, a in a buffer that is then sent to a monitoring center in case you crash your car or you have some issues. Well, taking one of those boxes from a company that claims to be quite mass market because they claim to have installed millions of boxes, it was easily jammed by a simple jammer, uh, a low-cost jammer that, uh, that we tested on them. And it was even easy to spoof the, the box. In fact, even with the static box, we were able to broadcast uh, in an anechoic chamber a signal that made the box believe that he was moving on a circle. So even with a simple Genesis signal simulator, uh, we were able to spoof it. And there were not even cross-checks between the output of the INS and of the GNSS unit. But if we move to smartphones, uh, we have now on the market smartphones that are uh, receiving the GNSS signals on two frequencies. And uh, especially if you look at uh, low-cost uh, jammers, they are just focused on the L1. And uh, so the fact that we have these uh, 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 double frequency uh, chips implemented in uh, some uh, uh, smartphones is bringing some level of robustness mm, uh, to, the, to, the, to the smartphone itself, to, so some robustness to jamming. And if you want to really spoof a, a, a smartphone, we realize that it's not so easy, especially, I mean, during uh, a, a, the, an analysis that we did in our research group in July this year, uh, during the Galileo uh, outage that was basically the transmission of uh, 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 ephemeris data that were not updated. Well, it was not easy to force the smartphone to trust uh, a, the, the right ephemeris that we were broadcasting. Uh, and uh, it's not so easy to convince the smartphone to use the information that is coming from your spoofing signal. That's, let's say, that's the message. Another mass market uh, equipment that is becoming very popular uh, are the drones. And if we look at some uh, uh, mass market drones, like the one that we tested in our, in our uh, uh, lab, uh, you see uh, the position that was uh, obtained on the, on the left in the first uh, set of figures, and the output of the GPS unit and of the inertial unit that is uh, implemented on board of the drone. Well, in this case, this drone was kind of robust to the jammer. Because even with a strong power of the, of the jammer, yes, we had some effect on the evaluated position. We see that there is something going on, but the position is not lost. And this is due probably to a coupling between the GPS unit and the IMU unit. And in fact, you see the effect on both of them. But there are other drones that are really mass market, and uh, this is the result for one of these autopilot units that are popular for uh, small racing quads and uh, small drones. Well, in this case, broadcasting a, or placing a hard spoofing attack, so simply broadcasting another GNSS signal, not even consistent with the one coming from the satellite in terms of uh, uh, timing, you see that at some point the position is completely lost and especially for the altitude, since we are speaking of drones, we were able to, let's say, make the drone believe that he was actually on the ground. Uh, so spoofing does exist. I mean, it's already occurring nowadays. Eh? And uh, we know that 
it's not so expensive to build in a lab a software receiver and a simple front end. So the risk is there. Uh, however, I'm still not really convinced that it's so easy to use properly this uh, spoofing device uh, for consumer equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, is a, a real threat, but it's not so easy, let's say, to, 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 to have it. Mm -hmm. For sure, there is a lesson learned from this, that uh, if we are speaking of um, consumer devices, we have to use them as consumer devices. Probably we are so concerned about the possible uh, attacks that we have on consumer devices because they are, we are using them out of their, let's say, leisure field for more serious and critical applications, no? or more critical of what they were designed for. Uh, so, of course, we can place spoofing, but we also saw that a simple jammer can make it, mm -hmm. and maybe it's enough if you really want to uh, want to place an attack. So, trying to draw some conclusion, multi-frequency GNSS chipset for smartphones are for sure providing some robustness to jamming. Mm -hmm. uh, smartphones are hard to spoof at signal level. Uh, they are getting information from the network, and. Uh, I would say that, I mean, what's the point of placing a complex spoofing attack if at the end you have the same, attack, same effect with a chip jammer? If you really want to take control of a smartphone, probably I would hire a good uh, hacker that is able to, uh, uh, to, 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 to enter the system, no? to enter the communication, to enter the firmware of the, of the smartphone, rather than placing the transmission of uh, you know, several, uh, several signals to take control of the smartphone. This, at the end of the day, was what happened with the Pokemon Go uh, hacking, you know, in which the position was simply replaced. And uh, actually, we had here in Torino uh, in July a, a big race of drones, and uh, at some point, some of these drones were hacked uh, and uh, nothing was working anymore and we were so excited saying okay finally let's say as researchers we have a spoofing attack in our uh, in our city actually this was actually a hacking attack i mean so someone inter uh, interfering with the communication channel of the telecom and of the drones and uh, not even a spoofing attack so this concludes my picture and i would just give the floor back to alan Thank you very much, Fabio. We're going to pass now from the difficulty, or ease as the case may be, of interfering with GNSS devices to looking at the actual impacts of interference with GNSS receivers and characterizations of some of those uh, interferences. And for that, we're going to hear from Guy Bunnell, uh, who is a PNT security technologist at Spirant Communications covering the areas of PNT threats and mitigation. Guy has more than 20 years experience working to protect GNSS receivers from emerging threats, having started his career as a systems engineer involved in the development of GPS adaptive antenna systems for military users. He holds a bachelor's honors degree in physics with atmospheric physics and a master's degree in communications engineering in 2019. He was appointed as a member of the International Advisory Council for the Resilient Navigation and Timing Foundation. Guy, tell us about the impacts of GNSS interference. Uh, well, good afternoon or good evening from the UK, everyone. Thanks for coming along to this seminar. Um, my presentation is in two parts. Um, in the first part, I'm going to take a look at a, a real um, interference event and uh, some of the impacts that were uh, experienced by users. And then when I come back for part two of the presentation, we'll take a more detailed look about some of the impacts that are going on in the receiver and how we can uh, start to assess the receiver's uh, performance. So GNSS interference isn't just about uh, low-powered cigarette lighter jammers. Um, it's about other things as well. We quite often see slide presentations with the cigarette lighter jammers and quite uh, rightly because there are a lot of them around. But we also see things like nation state jamming 
And we've experienced or uh, seen nation state jamming a lot in the last few years. There have been experiences in Norway and uh, North Finland um, where civil aviation users have experienced interference uh, from uh, 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 military exercises. The Middle East at the moment as well is uh, there are a lot there's a lot of nation state interference going on in the Middle East, um, East Mediterranean and also North Korea. Nation state jamming is is quite sophisticated and very powerful. Um, we also have to uh, be aware of adjacent band interference these days. You know, we're in a world where there's a demand for connectivity and bandwidth, uh, demand for new 5G services, and and the transmitters that use them in these situations are millions of times more powerful than, than the GPS signals. So the the you know the chances of being uh, of, of coming across interference under those circumstances are, is quite high. Um, yeah, uh, GNSS interference is becoming a reality in many of the commercial sectors. The example we're going to look at um, tonight is commercial aviation. Um, commercial aviation is becoming more reliant on space-based uh, PNT. Um, it starts to enable three-dimensional position determination. Um, there's also an increasing reliance on GNSS for area navigation, which is called RNAV. Um, and GPS is also an essential component for many of the other aviation systems, such as enhanced proximity uh, warning systems and the ADSB. So interference to systems reliant on GNSS is a real issue. Uh, many examples of uh, disruption, which is, we'll see one in a minute. As a background to the um, example I'm going to um, show you, uh, there have been more than 250 incidents of GPS disruption reported by pilots through the NASA's um, ASRS reporting scheme since 2013. And in Eurocontrol in 2018, um, there were 815 incidents of GPS disruption reported. Uh, mainly, this was around the eastern Mediterranean um, area around Europe. Significant disruption can result uh, from this, missed approaches, uh, delays, cancellations. So there's quite a large economic impact. And um, I've got a, or included a typical flight crew report. Um, this was a, a flight crew operating into Ben Gurion International Airport in Israel. And as you can see from that report, um, although the crew were in VFR conditions, so there wasn't a safety issue, um, they experienced um, some warning messages and a ship shift in the map, which uh, actually um, meant, meant that, that that they would not have been able to use that approach if, 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 if the weather had been pretty bad. So you can see there a typical dry crew report. Um, so the case study that we were taking a look at here is one that happened at, in Manila at Nino Aquino um, International Airport. Um, there were multiple reports of GPS interference um, on approach to runway 24. And the, the picture on the right-hand side of this slide um, actually shows what was found out as the reports came in. They realized that the, um, and the, the drawing shows the uh, approach path to runway 24, that the interference was coming in a radius of about two nautical miles at 14 miles from the touchdown. And the pilots were experiencing loss of uh, GNSS functionality on board. Um, decrease in navigation performance, which is quite interesting. So increasing horizontal errors um, and, and navigational performance de decreasing, uh, which led to some missed approaches. Um, and in some aircraft, um, there were uh, large map, map shifts and, and impacts on the ground proximity warning systems as a result of that. So they got false alerts as well in the cockpit. Um, and loss of autoland and the ADS-B uh, reporting uh, capabilities. So, so when the authorities started to um, investigate um, the, the, the interference at Nino Kino International Airport, as you can see from the previous slide, there was a, uh, you know, a strong probability that the interferer was within about two nautical miles um, of, of a position 14 miles away from touchdown. Um, so the authorities started looking at broadcasting stations and cell phone towers, um, and the first two sub so the first suspect was a TV broadcasting station tower. The second suspect was uh, two cell phone towers, which both initially indicated that they were emitting transmissions on the GPS frequency, but eventually they were cleared. It wasn't them at all. The third suspect was another digital TV broadcasting station. And in actual fact, what 
it, what actually happened was that when repairs were going on to the digital TV broadcasting station that was Suspect 3, um, they noticed that bullet damage was discovered and that bullet damage obviously was um, was to do with the antenna because as soon as the bullet damage was repaired, the GS GNSS interference then actually stopped altogether. And uh, finally, in August 2017, um, aircraft operators were able to resume utilization of the RNAV approaches to both runways. So it was a little while between that for that problem to be isolated and closed down. And with that, that's uh, part one of my presentation, so I'll hand back to Alan now. Thanks very much, Guy. We'll be back in about five or six minutes with the second part of Guy's presentation. But first, we're going to take a few questions from the audience, uh, and, uh, and we'll have a polling question as well. Our first question comes in for Fabio. Fabio, do you consider it possible that an attempt of intentional spoofing of a large number of consumer devices in a city or in part of it uh, similar to what happened in the Black Sea. Oh well, I this is uh, let's say my, uh, my my answer is actually another question. So, what is the intention of a of someone placing an attack like that? Uh, if you really want to take control of several devices, you need to know a lot about those devices, and if you want to make those devices to evaluate a position that you want uh, is not easy at all. If you just want to create some damage, then probably a jammer would be uh, more effective on a larger scale. So we should be scared more of jamming attacks if you are looking at uh, a large area, in my opinion, while if you are looking to a specific device that could be, let's say, uh, disrupted, then maybe a spoofing attack should, should be, I mean, could be, could be a threat for it. Thank you, Fabio. Guy, we have a question for you. Uh, your case study deals with interference in commercial aviation. What other sectors have you seen real impacts caused by GP, uh, GNSS interference? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I thought the aviation case was quite an interesting one because we saw a lot of a range of various impacts. Um, but the U.S. Coast Guard um, now has a, a, a site on Navsen where they actually report all of the um, incidents and, and problems that people are having with GPS. So um, that's quite an instructive website and it's well worth a look. And when you take a look there, you can see that the maritime sector is also um, experienced significant interference events. Um, funnily enough, or not funnily enough, in fact, um, it, they, they tend to be in the same areas that aviation have experienced problems. So um, not in North Finland or Norway, but the Middle East, East Mediterranean, and around the coast of Korea have all been areas where uh, maritime industry has had and experienced interference. And recently, there have been a couple of reports from the port of Shanghai as well. So it isn't just aviation. There are other sectors experiencing it. Thanks, Guy. Another question for you, Fabio, uh, from the audience. E even if we see dual-frequency consumer receivers, uh, this uh, audience member supposes that their second signal tracking is guided. That is, it's simpler and less resource-consuming. So if L1 is spoofed, would L5 be able to help L1 in such a scenario? I would say that there are a lot of things that are unknown to us on what is the actual processing inside the chipset. <clears throat> I tend to agree with the statement of, uh, of uh, who placed this question, because of course in a consumer device you try to uh, save power and complexity. Uh, in this case, I would say that of course if L5 is uh, guided by L1, you are disrupting bo both the frequencies. But on the other end, I would say that, for example, this assistance that is required downloading the almanac from the network that is made to simplify the computation on board of the smartphone is in some way an anti-spoofing because, uh, of course, you might have signals that are un not consistent with the information about the satellite position. and the, the best that can happen is that the smartphone is not providing any, any position at all. 
Thank you, Fabio. We're going to return to Guy's presentation in a moment, and following that, we'll hear from Paul Alves at Novotel. But uh, first, let's have another uh, polling question for the audience, please, Lori. All right, Alan, and uh, folks on the screen is our second poll question. Which of the following are you most concerned about? Choices are intentional malicious jamming, general wireless communication interference, self-induced uh, system interference, another type of interference not mentioned here, or none. So 57% uh, coming in with intentional malicious jamming, 30% general wireless communication interference, 7% self-induced system interference, 4% another type of interference not mentioned, and 1% uh, uh, none. Alan, any thoughts there? Well, as expected, a majority, a significant majority, is concerned with intentional or malicious jamming. And for that, we all have to be on the lookout. However, uh, a s significant portion is concerned about wireless communication interference. That is, inadvertent interference. And this is uh, equally a concern because... Uh, and and does seem to be occurring quite frequently. In fact, uh, we could he hear a little bit more from the panelists on this subject, but it it almost seems to be more common than intentional jamming, and is and is just as difficult to identify and locate and deal with. And as wireless communication gets to be ever more pervasive in our modern society, there are ever increasing potential sources of such interference. Uh, the other, the other categories seem to draw less less concern or worry. Uh, very illuminating. Let's go back to now the second half of your presentation, guy, on impacts and characterization of interference. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, quite, um, I think, relevant to that that last survey question because. I'm actually going to be looking at some of the impacts that interference caused to a receiver. The case study we looked at was actually caused by um, a, 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 board, a broadcast tower, um, which, which, uh, which so it was definitely accidental interference. And I'm going to be looking primarily at out-of-band interference and its impact on the receiver here. Um, so when we start to um, evaluate the impact of GNSS interference on receivers, there are a few questions that we need to ask that are all very relevant. And from my point, as, or from our point of view as, as testers, it's actually quite easy to emulate different interferer types as long as we can generate enough jammer to signal ratio and inject the, the, the right signals into the simulation. It's, it's, it's all possible. Um, and we can also record and replay the RF environment. Um, you need to have enough bit depth in the recorder to, to capture interference as well as the GNSS signals. So there are all ways that you can simulate interference. But the big question is how on earth, uh, having managed to take that interference and inject it or simulate it into receivers, how do you monitor the performance of receivers and, and make it a level playing field so that you, you get a decent set of um, results and a, a, a decent set of findings that you can compare. Well, that gets quite tricky, but there is, um, in fact, some work that has been done on this. The U.S. Um, Air Force did a background paper, in fact, on a thing called the um, 1 dB interference protection criterion. And the idea of this is that um, if you start to look at receiver's parameters such as horizontal position error or time to first fix, when you think about it, to compare those requires that you inject a harmful level of interference into the receiver. And that harmful level of interference is different from for each receiver. So that doesn't actually seem like a good way of comparing. However, the 1 dB um, increase in carrier to noise ratio actually equates to uh, limiting an aggregate interfering signal power to six decibels below the, the noise level of the receiver. That sounds like it might be quite a good metric because it's independent of, of any harmful level of interference. And there is, a, in fact, well-established theory for using um, this as a, as, a, as a measure. 
Well, we decided to have a look and, and see how effective this metric was on GNSS equipment receivers in particular. And so what we did is set up a, 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 G, a PNT test bench, which is an automated test bench. The reason we did it using an auto test bench was we wanted to collect a lot of data. So we wanted to collect more than one or two measurements for each receiver and confirm that actually we, we would see a, a move in the carrier to noise ratio, the decrease, um, before any degradation in receiver parameters. We wanted to confirm that uh, for ourselves. So this was the test setup that we used in the lab. And this is the first receiver we tested. I'm not going to talk about brands. These are all anonymous, anonymized receivers. Um, what we had a, a look at here was um, testing the receiver for out-of-band interference at 1554 megahertz for the uh, GNSS RED test, amongst other things. But we went further than the RED test level on this particular receiver. Um, the, the, red, the first red arrow is the RED test level for 1554 megahertz. That's the uh, GNSS radio equipment directive test that's been introduced. So all receivers coming into Europe uh, now have to go through this test for adjacent band interference. And we also marked with a red, with a red, second red arrow, uh, the point exactly where the carrier to noise ratio dropped by more than one dB, which is where if it had been below the RED test level, it would have failed the test. As you can see for this particular receiver, that level was, was way higher. Um, but also notice if you look down at the bottom blue line, that is recording horizontal position error and uh, in meters. Um, and I've got range bars um, included there as well. And you can see that the, the receiver's horizontal position error just starts to degrade uh, somewhat after the, that carrier to noise ratio has dropped by 1 dB, which is good. It happens after that drop. So that, um, and then we see the, as the interference or the RFI power level increases, that receiver um, degradation starts to get more severe which is quite instructive because we can see that by looking at the carrier to noise ratio, we're looking at that gray area where the receiver doesn't stop working altogether, but where the receiver starts to degrade its performance. And this is where you can get the subtly misleading information coming out of a receiver. Um, and the second chart is the same, but showing five receivers that we tested in the lab or with the automated test bench. And you can see that, 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 some, that there's marked differences in the receivers. Um, all I can say about the, the, the two plots, um, the, the purple one and the brown one, uh, and, and the yellow, uh, uh, yellow and purple uh, plots, which are way to the left of the graph, is that those are both older receivers and high sensitivity receivers, uh, whereas the other ones are way, way to the right are more modern receivers. So you can see that, that some receivers, especially the older ones, are clearly much more susceptible to RFI than others, especially newer receivers. But you can see that all of them, all of those five receivers, the 1 dB drop happens before the receiver's horizontal position error starts to degrade. And, and that's quite interesting. It shows that the carrier to noise ratio drop of 1 dB is a really, really good metric for this. Um, and I think to, to wrap up then, a, a few um, insights. Uh, firstly, we see GNSS interference being experienced in many application areas. Quite often, that interference is collateral. It's not targeted, and sometimes it's from a faulty comms or broadcast system, as we saw in the Manila. Um, and it's not necessarily someone who really wants to disrupt your system. There's definitely a need for risk assessment when deploying um, GNSS systems. Unexpected behavior it can result otherwise, and the impacts can be significant, as we've seen. Uh, we verified that carrier to noise ratio is a very good metric for re re assessing receiver performance under interference. And I think the other important point is that there is definitely a need to detect and locate sources of GNSS interference in a, in a timely manner. And uh, with that, I'll hand you back to Alan. Thanks very much, Guy. And following up on your last point, very appropriately, we have Paul Alves from Novatel to talk about uh, just that point that you raised, how to locate interferers. That's the first step in dealing with them. Uh, Paul is technology manager at Correction Services, uh, of Correction Services at Novatel. Excuse me. Paul received a PhD from the Department of Geomatics Engineering at the University of Calgary. He has nearly 20 years of experience as a positioning algorithm specialist working on RTK, network RTK, and PPP algorithms. Paul, the floor is Thanks, yours. Alan. Thank you very much. 
So I'm going to be talking about how to how to locate interference. And in general, there's there's three main techniques that people use to to um, as measurements in order to determine where an interference source is coming from. Uh, the first one is angle of arrival or direction of arrival, and this is typically done with antenna arrays or multi-element antennas. And the other two are what I'm going to focus on today: time difference of arrival, where the front end data from multiple receivers is correlated against each other and I'll show you some an example of that and that's going to give you the the time of arrival difference between the interference signal at two different receivers and power difference of arrival where the power of the interferer is measured at multiple locations and they're combined together to give you an idea of where the interference source is coming from but before we get too far into this, let's get an idea for what these measurements actually look like in two dimensions. And to do this, we're just going to set up a little simulation. So the yellow dots here are two receivers. So we're going to place two receivers out there and we'll fix an interference source at some, at some location. Uh, for time difference arrival, for example, we'll calculate the distance between where we've placed our interferer and the receivers. We'll calculate that distance, and we'll calculate the distance to both receivers, and the difference of that distances converted into time through the speed of light is going to give us our difference in time of arrival. So that's our true time of arrival. And then on top of that, we can create a grid, and from each of those grid points, we can calculate what the time of arrival, time difference of arrival would be from that location. And then we can do the difference between those two. So what the actual time of arrival is and what the the time of arrival should be if the interferer was at that point. And we can then create a surface plot of what those errors are between where the grid point time of arrival would be and where the interference source time of arrival actually is. And then you get a picture that looks like this. So the yellow dots on the picture are the locations of those two receivers. The black dot is where we've placed the transmitter. And then the, the surface plot underneath is the likelihood of the transmission for that observation, that time difference of arrival observation. So the lighter this color is, the more likely the, the transmitter is going to be in that location, and the darker it is, the less likely that the transmitter is in that location. So in this particular orientation, the, the receivers know that there's an interference source kind of in this vertical line, but they can't really tell where that interference source is coming from. And the, there's kind of a cone of uncertainty that increases slowly as you move farther away from the, from the receivers. And now we can look at what this looks like as we change that time difference of arrival uh, across the board. So the top left image here shows the time difference of arrival, where the time difference of arrival is equal for the two receivers. And as we move to the right and then down, the receiver on the left will receive the interference signal just slightly before the receiver on the right. And the last image where kind of the two cones have, have come together, in this case, the time difference of arrival is equal to the distance between the two receivers. So the interferer is directly in line with the two receivers. So what's interesting about this is is uh, gives you an idea of what the measurement looks like. Um, there's also people that tend to start thinking about time and arrival, think back to high school conics and think, oh, well, it's a parabola, so therefore it's curving as it moves further away. And you can see from this that, that those, those measurement lines are very straight. And that's one of the reasons why time difference of arrival is used in, in, um, in kind of giving a direction or a bearing to the, the interferer. Now let's look at what power difference of arrival looks like as a measurement. Time difference of arrival is a little bit more well known. Uh, power difference of arrival is less known. So power difference of, of arrival is based on the power loss as the interference signal moves away from the transmitter. And it's going to move away with free space loss if there's nothing in the way, where it's going to decrease with this log logarithmic um, decay function. And on the right-hand side is some early early measurements that we had, and you can kind of see how it fits to the model that's shown in red. And power difference arrival has a very interesting picture. So again, on the top left, the power that's being received by both receivers is, is the same, similar to what we did for time difference arrival. And as we move to the right and down, the power that's received by the left receiver becomes higher than the power that's received by the right receiver. What's really interesting here is, is when the power that's being received is the same by both receivers, so the interferer is somewhere in line with the two receivers, you get uh, this, this very wide circle. So this, this observation gives you very little information on where the interferer is. 
But as the interferer moves uh, more in line of the two receivers, then you get this tighter donut shape or this tighter oval shape. And the nice thing about this is, is where time difference arrival gives you a nice bearing or direction of where the interferer is, power difference of arrival can give you an estimate of your distance to the interferer or your range to the target. And there's no reason that these can't be used together in combination. So we've created this cool retro 80s looking uh, picture. And let me explain what that looks like first. So the straight lines in this picture are the time difference of arrival. So those are the time difference arrival measurements we're getting. And the oval lines are the power difference of arrival. The darker the lines means the more likelihood, the, the higher likelihood that the interferer is in that zone, and the lighter lines, uh, the less likely. And really that's just to give it that, that, cool, that cool retro 80s look. Uh, so we can combine these together. And the important thing here is to look at the color underneath. So the, the color underneath is a combination. So yellow, bright yellow is the most, lo most likely location of the transmitter and and it's a mix of both of those two measurements together. And now we can move the location of the transmitter throughout this field and get an idea for what this kind of dual combined time and power difference arrival measurement looks like. From the last plot, we know that if the, if the transmitter is somewhat between the two receivers, then power difference of arrival doesn't give you a lot of information. So for example, the top right image where the the interference source is kind of between the two receivers. Uh, you get a picture that looks very much just like time difference arrival. But as the transmitter moves in line, uh, in the line of the two receivers, so for example, the last bottom most row of these images, you can see that you get this nice combination of, of uh, direction of interference source and distance to interference source. So the direction comes from the time difference arrival and the distance comes from the power difference arrival. So let's look at a few examples. So let's start with, with an example of, of uh, time difference arrival. And to do this, we're going to be using a feature in OEMs and a feature in OEM seven called Sprinkler. This was originally developed uh, in research from the OEM six, and that's the results I'm going to be showing today. But the same performance or the same functionality is available now on OEM seven. What we do in OEM seven is we're going to output the the precisely time tag tagged. RF data from the front end of the receiver. And if the interferer source has some sort of structure to the signal, then we can correlate those two against each other and find out what the time difference of arrival of that signal is between those two receivers. Uh, like Fabio was saying, sometimes in research, things, this, these bad events like this, um, this hacking of a uh, of a, a drone competition is sometimes a fun event for researchers. And this is one of those cases. So here at our building in, in Calgary, uh, every day at about 6.30, we would have a truck drive right by our building with one of these personal privacy devices, or what we think are probably one of these personal privacy devices, which as a researcher, for a community, that's not, that's not great. But as a researcher, it's like, great, I get, I get to try out my new toy. Uh, from someone else anyway. Uh, so we set up we set up four receivers that are shown here in the picture on the left and on the right, you can see an idea of how we kind of rig these these receivers to, to fence posts. And there's a sign here uh, you can see in the picture, which is gonna come up. We're gonna see if we can catch this this uh, jammer, this, this interference source coming down the highway. And so we set up a camera to see if we can catch it. This is the, the pattern that we recognize that we got from the jammer. So this is the, the structure of the signal that's being broadcast by the jammer to try and disrupt the GPS unit, probably intended for the truck that, that we're gonna see in the next few pictures, um, but would also be jamming everybody nearby. And this is what the, the data looks like. So on the top right-hand side, there's these two horizontal colored bars. That's the raw RF data that's, that's coming out of the receiver. It just looks like noise, obviously, until you correlate it against each other. When you correlate it against each other, you get the red line that's shown in the plot in the background. And the x-axis of that, of that plot is the time difference. So it's the amount that you have to shift the two receivers um, in order for them to line up. And when we do this, and we line it up with the camera and the time, we think that the jammer is coming from this white truck. So there it is, and there it goes. And he comes by around 6.30 every evening. 
Okay, so let's look at power difference arrival and, and an example of what we can get with power difference arrival. For power difference arrival, we're going to be using the interference toolkit, which is a feature available on OEM7, all OEM7 cards. Uh, OEM, the interference toolkit gives you all the tools necessary to detect, characterize, and mitigate interference. And it also gives you a great measurement that you can use for power difference arrival if you want to do direction finding using power difference arrival. So we're going to focus mainly on that, the power that we get out of the interference toolkit and use that for power difference arrival or, or, um, or interference finding. So we can get power difference or power measurements from three different locations in the receiver, pre-decimation, post-decimation, and post-filter. Uh, the plot on the left, the red line shows, shows pre-decimation and the gold line shows post-decimation. And on the right-hand side, the gold line shows pre-filter and the blue line shows post-filter. And the spike that you see on the right-hand side is, a, is an interferer that we've injected in here. And the great thing about ITK is, is you can measure the power pre-filter, and then you can apply a, a notch filter. So the blue here, you can see the, the effects of the notch filter to try and remove the, the impacts of this interference, if this interferer. So you can measure the power in order to locate the interferer, but apply a notch filter so it doesn't impact your positioning. This is what the, the power measurement looks like. So we did a sweep of, of input power, so jamming power across the spectrum, and at the same time measured what that power was. And you see this very nice, clean measurement. The ITK absolute power is calibrated for a wide variety of, of impacts, so temperature, receiver design, interference type, and so on, so that this measurement is accurate to 5 dB. And if you calibrate for the antenna, you can reduce it down to about 2.2 dB which makes it great for interference finding. And once we receive this power from one location, this is what that measurement looks like from only one receiver. We kind of looked at what it looked like in two receivers before. Uh, you get this curve. So this, is, this blue curve shows what the potential transmitter power would be as a function of distance from our, from our location. And with just a single one, you can't really tell if there's a weak transmitter that's close to you or a strong transmitter that's far away from you. But when you combine two of them together, then you get the intersection of the two. And we looked at this before with the power difference of arrival. So you can do it as a bunch of independent observations, or you can difference them and get, get this oval shape that's shown on the, on the left-hand side. We have two different ways to do interference finding. One of them is, uh, is quite simple. We just use the free space loss model. From each of those measured power locations, we create a grid just like we did before uh, to create those, those visualized plots that I showed at the beginning. So we create a grid, and from each of those grid points, we calculate what the transmit power must be at that location in order for it to be received at the power that it was received by at the receiver's location. And then we look for the, the best fit between all of the observations that we have. And we call this the fit map. The other one is, is if we don't trust the free space loss model, or if you think that there's some terrain effects that are causing more decrease in power as you move farther away, then we also have a way to estimate what the transmit power is plus the constant and the rate of decay of the energy or the power as it moves farther away. And we can estimate this using all of that data and then again plotting what, the, what provides the best fit of those residuals. And here's an example from Tokyo. So in this particular data set, um, our company was called out because a customer was doing a critical demo and they wanted to make sure that they wouldn't be inter impacted by interference. So they, we drove through a few of the different potential demonstration spots to measure interference just to make sure that it would be clean. And lucky for my research, they weren't all clean. So this is one of the examples. The plot on the right-hand side shows a roller coaster plot. We call this the roller coaster plot. Uh, and the height of that yellow line is the power of the interference. So you can see that, that we get this nice peak as we approach the interference source and this decay as we move away. The bottom left plot is the, is we call it a river plot. So the, the vertical axis is the frequency and the horizontal accuracy is, ac axis is time. And then you can see the little dot, the little impact of this, of this interferer source. So you can see um, how much, how wide the bandwidth was of the, of the transmitter and for how long it was impacting us. And if we combine all of this together, uh, we fit it to our model, so this is what the data looks like. You can see it fits quite well to that to that decay model. 
And this is what we get for an estimate of where that receiver location is for both the fit map and the estimation map, fit map on the left and the estimation map on the right. And from this, we think that the interference source is either coming from the parking lot, which is most likely, or just inside the building. So that's it. I talked about time difference arrival and power difference for arrival. Uh, back to you, Alan. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we have some questions coming up about uh, j just those last points, power difference of arrival and time difference of arrival. But first, I want to let the audience know that to dig deeper into the topics that we've addressed here, we have some resources available to you. Uh, one is a document describing the interference toolkit from Novatel, and then there are some technical papers uh, that, that do go quite in depth on, on this matter. Uh, you'll see them there, demonstrated interference detection and mitigation, interference likelihood mapping, and interference mapping using received power. All uh, resources available to you, and the, the links are there to, to uh, connect directly to the papers. All right, our first question from the audience. Uh, first question g goes to Paul. Is it possible to locate spoofers the same as you have shown for interferers? So the answer to this is, is yes and maybe. Depends on how, how the spoofer is or how you're being spoofed. So um, uh, as Fabio showed, there's lots of different ways to be spoofed. If, you're, if you get spoofed in, in kind of a hacking sense, like in the way that Pokemon Go... Uh, was hacked by people and just injecting their position in, then the methods that I discussed aren't going to help you in this situation. And on the other end of the spectrum, the very sophisticated spoofers where where they're transmitting each individual satellite from a different antenna in a different location, uh, these methods probably aren't going to help you there. But if the spoofer is being transmitted all from the same the same antenna, then the that provides a lot of structure for time difference of arrival, and it provides also a power difference for a power difference of arrival. Um, but there's the caveat that the, the positioning and timing, at least for time difference of arrival, needs to be continuously running. So you, so you have to mitigate the effects of the spoofer, um, but, it, but it should be possible in, in, in those cases. All right. Paul, another question for you. How do the time difference or power difference methods account for trees, cars, or other obstructions? So time difference arrival for, for obstructions is going to look a lot like multipath, where it'll just create a bit of error in, uh, in your measurement. And uh, it does tend to, to affect power difference arrival more so. The research that I did all had a static, uh, static interference source, so I could I could average the data from multiple sources in order to average out the effects of terrain or, or vehicles, buildings, and whatnot. Thanks, Paul. We have a question I'm going to ask the entire panel to answer. Uh, perhaps we'll go first to Guy on this, but uh, someone wants to know, would receiver standards help in the matter of interference detection and mitigation, or is it better just to leave innovation to the market and to the manufacturers? Uh, well, that's um, that's a really good question, actually, and, and quite a complicated one, um, because you know I used to be um, I used to work for a re receiver uh, manufacturer, and you know we used to you know there were a lot of standards out there, and and the trouble with things like interference or spoofing or and or spoofing are that the the landscape's changing all the time, and it takes a long time to write a standard. And by the time that standard's published, things have changed, and the standard can look outdated. Having said that, there's definitely a place for guidelines or recommendations somewhere, um, and there's definitely a place for having standards um, applied to test methodologies. Um, in, in other words, the way things are measured, the way things are compared ought to be standard, like the, the 1 dB carrier to noise metric we saw earlier. That's a, a consistent measure that can uh, yield good comparisons. But industry is very, very good at innovation, and we must allow industry to, 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 to do that. Thanks, Guy. Viewpoints on this from Fabio or Paul? Well, of course, being an academic, I'm on the side of innovation, no? But I would say also that standards help, uh, especially if they are kind of minimum performance standards, so that if you use that receiver, you know that you have a minimum level of performance or robustness against jammers, for example. 
then me, innovation will come on top of that because of course we anyone any company uh, is targeting an improvement no of the performance uh, but i would say that standards i don't know if they help but for sure they are needed depending on the application for some application fields where you are using these GNSS receivers i could see situations where um where defining what the measure is, is would be very handy, but there's such a wide variety of applications of GNSS, like everything from, you know, hobby hobbyists just um, playing around with it in their backyards to phones all the way to autonomous driving, and it would seem restrictive to try and uh, to try and put a limit across the entire board. But I could definitely see certain industries are going to lean more towards uh, being more safe or less safe. But, but I would ed edge against doing that across the board because there are such a wide variety of, uh, of applications. Thanks. Uh, this has been a question of some, uh, drawing some discussion in the past that, that I've heard with, with some people pressing for standards and other people uh, pressing back saying, no, it's, it's best to let, let the market determine or let... Uh, let manufacturers institute as, as they, they see most appropriate. And I, I guess we can say that the question remains open and a vital one for further discussion. We have one now uh, regarding telecommunications. Uh, in Europe, there will be 4G signals in the L1 band, uh, very close, in fact, to the GNSS signals. Uh, as an example for, for simulation of interference, uh, can you address this one for us, uh, Fabio? Uh, we know that we have communications close to the L1 band, but I would like to point out that when you are speaking of GNSS receivers, we are saying, I mean, a lot of things altogether. I mean, it depends, as Guy well shown, uh, in his presentation, the effect is my, it might be very different. Some of them might be more robust, others less robust. In, for some of them, you can have, have an effect that goes uh, down to the estimated position. For some others, okay, something is going on, but the position is still, uh, let's say, good enough. So, yes, we saw not specifically for 4G, uh, but for example, for digital TV transmitters, that there are effects due to harmonics that fall on or very close the GNSS bandwidth, um, the effect is very different. Uh, uh, so frankly speaking, there's no unique answer to this. I mean, even some older receivers, they looked more robust just because they have a less sensitive AGC. And so they were kind of cutting out the variations uh, the, the fast variations due to these uh, harmonics. Some others that were supposed to be more robust were more affected because we're more sensitive. So uh, there's not unique answer. I'm sorry for uh, who placed this question, but for sure, uh, I mean, this is an issue, yes. Especially when you're close to the transmitting towers. Guy or Paul, any input on that? Uh, yeah, it's Guy. Um, just I think just to say that you, you know, if you follow GPS, you know that the, 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 G, the GPS has struggled with with adjacent band compati compatibility issues for a long time. And it's as Fabio says, you know, the effects on receivers can be markedly different um, when assessing out of band interference. Again, it, it, this um, carrier to noise ratio drop of one dB is a uniform metric that you can use to to, to kind of predict or, or kind of assess how a receiver behaves but it, it it's true that receivers behave very very differently when subject to, to harmful levels of interference as soon as, as soon as that happens it it gets very tricky so it's a very complicated question and Paul anything from you before I pass the next question which has to do with power difference of arrival no I don't have anything to add to that one Okay. Well, here's one for you. The power difference of arrival model that you showed is for static interferers. What do you do if the interferer is moving? Uh, so if the interferer is moving, then um, 
you need to account with that by either by either using some sort of model of what speed you think that the vehicle is going at to try and do averaging that way, or you need to set up multiple receivers. And you can do it. You could do it effectively, creating creating either two or multiple receivers and having the interferer pass through it or beside it. All right. Uh, thank you. And Paul, how long should the baseline be between two receivers or, or two antennas for reliable detection in your method? So detection is probably the wrong word here. I think you're probably looking for for location uh, because detection detection is not dependent on that. But um, right. assuming that you meant location. Um, so it depends on the accuracy that you're looking for, the accuracy of the locator that you're looking for. Uh, so for time difference arrival, we found that that tens of meters is is typically what we would like. But if the um, but it doesn't need to be that way. You can you can have a few meters apart, and you can still get a reasonably accurate um, time difference arrival. Power difference arrival, I don't have a great answer for, and that's actually the reason I started creating those plots that I showed at the beginning of my presentation. Uh, but it seems to be so dependent on on the relative distance of the transmitter between the and the the baseline length and the orientation of the two. So it's kind of this weird two or three dimensional problem. So that one I'm still working on. It's a good question. All right, we'll we'll uh, check back with you <laughs> at the appropriate time. Not not during this webinar, but uh, we'll try to get back to you uh, or, or let us know when when you have an answer. Uh, for that. Uh, another one uh, for you, Paul. If, if GPS is being jammed, how do you synchronize your multiple receivers in order to measure the TDOA? Yeah, so that's, that is a limitation of the, of the time difference of arrival um, method, is that, is that you need that precise timing. Um, so one of, the, one of the ways you could do it is, it, is if you um, had both antenna feeds coming into the same receiver that then had the same receiver clock that was driving both of them, then that's one way to, to kind of get around it. Um, but that is one of the limitations if you have two receivers that are that are separate from each other. The other limitation, of course, being that you need position. You could get around this by, by just having a static position or position from another source, obviously. All right. The questions are coming fast and furious now. Uh, another one about TDOA for you, Paul. Often TDOA is linked to synchronization time accuracy between TDOA receivers, but uh, other parameters uh, can disturb the measurements in TDOA receivers as multipath, for example. Uh, could you please explain or elucidate further on this? So, uh, hmm, okay. So, multipath, like multipath will will impact you because you'll get you'll kind of get a mix of the direct and the and the reflected signal coming in and so you'll correlate between both of them kind of the same way that the correlation peak affects your uh, the accuracy of your GPS receiver so you'll kind of get you'll kind of get this spreading out effect um, once the multipath is far enough away um, that it starts to move out of the peak just the same as, as GPS right then then it starts to impact you less it depends on how you're doing the, the correlation though what you're using is the measurement of the peak. That, that, that could be a quite complex answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one, one for Fabio. Uh, Fabio, what uh, power do the commercial low-cost jammers provide on average? More, more or less than, than one watt or, or 30 uh, dB? Uh, again, uh, I'm skipping the precise uh, answer because again, here you might have different uh, di different levels of power get uh, that you can get. The light jammers, the 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 other that you can buy, yeah, they can reach up to one watt, uh, but it really depends. I mean, it depends also what you consider as low low cost jammer. So, if you are looking at something with uh, hundreds of euros or dollars, you might even get uh, powers that are stronger than that. That means that, of course, the area of influence of those jammers is, uh, is stronger, is larger. 
All right, thanks. Back to you again, Paul. One listener wants to would like you to review, if you can, one part of your presentation. Could you and ask? Could you please explain a little more slowly the difference in direction and distance findings between uh, POA and TDOA? So, sorry, can you say that again? Yeah. The difference. The difference in in how time difference arrival and power difference arrival work? Right. Oh, okay. So time difference of arrival is looking for, for structure in the interferer. And, um, and it's going to, so some sort of pattern that's being broadcast, and it's going to correlate that pattern between the two receivers to figure out um, how long it was from when it was received at one receiver to another. And this is going to give you that, those kind of straight line measurements. So for this, you need precise timing, like the question that that happened earlier, and you need to know the location of those of those those receivers. For power difference arrival, you're strictly looking at at what the the received power of the interferer is. So how much how much power do you measure from that interferer above the noise floor? And and for this, the power is going to decay as you get farther away from the transmitter. So you measure that 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 decay is not going to be linear, right? With time difference of arrival. The um, the ray propagates out at the speed of light, so it's kind of linear. All it's always traveling at the speed of light. But for power difference arrival, it decays with this logarithmic function. So the farther away you get from the transmitter, the the rate that it decays starts to level out, and that becomes a worse measurement. So your your measurement is of the power. Hopefully that helps. If not, there's those um, there's those two papers that that are in the presentation. That will hopefully fill in the gaps. Right, and that presentation slide, uh, the the bibliography, so to speak, the the additional resources is available to all webinar attendees. You'll get a uh, a downloaded package of the of the presentation slides as part of your registration. One final question for you, Paul: uh, Would a phased array give better detection performance? And in that case, what detection principle would you use? Um, I unfortunately don't have a lot of experience with with phased arrays, um, but in general, just from a general geomatics background, um, the more observations you can throw into to location, the better. So if you can use a combination of of using a phased array for angle of arrival or, di or direction of arrival, its direction of arrival is also great for for um, for much shorter distances between the two antennas. Just throw that out there, um, and then combine that with something like power difference arrival as you're moving around. Then you're going to end up with the the best overall solution. All right. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, that concludes the question and answer section of our webinar. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to uh, provide a concluding comment about the, the nature of interference and their uh, perspectives on it. Uh, we'll very quickly go from Fabio to Guy to Paul and then we'll, we'll wind up with a, uh, with a last comment. Uh, Fabio? Well, what I would say is that, I mean, we saw that anyway, the, the threat is there. So uh, I think that there's still research on this uh, due to the variability of cases that we saw. And also, uh, I mean, on the evolution that unfortunately these malicious attacks are having. So we have, you know, to catch up every time. And so still a lot of work to do. And I think that we saw today also some very good solutions that are being developed also by companies. So that would be my perspective eh, for the future. Guy, a closing comment from you? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, uh, I think from my point of view, you know, the father of GPS, Brad Parkinson, has a 
a framework called protect, toughen, and augment. And, you know, I think there's a lot we can do to uh, deal with interference using that framework. It's all about, uh, you know, the, the threat from interference is real um, from whatever the source. Risk assessment and testing is, is vital to make sure you don't get caught out by unexpected um, effects. Legislation is important too. And, of course, you know, the detection and, and geolocation is, is really important to minimize disruption too. It's a complicated area. Agreed, a complicated area. Paul, closing comment from you. Yeah, just to add a little bit, um, it's important that, that we keep innovating on, on what our detection methods are and, and mitigation methods to try and make it as robust as possible. And I think there's the other side that, that um, uh, it's a good idea to try and inform the public that these personal privacy devices that they buy so readily or cheaply online um, have an impact outside of their vehicle and to the greater community around them, particularly as GNSS gets used in more applications. Yes, I think that's going to be an ongoing struggle, uh, educating the public, which may not uh, understand, well, certainly does not understand many of the intricacies and complexities of uh, satellite navigation, above all that the signal is uh, so weak and buried underneath the, the noise floor and, and anything like uh, uh, a personal privacy device can severely impact it. Uh, I want to thank uh, our panel in closing, Fabio Lois from Politecnico di Torino, Guy Bunel from Spirant, and Paul Alves from Novatel. I want to thank our sponsor, Novatel, for making this webinar possible. Thank you to you, the audience, for attending from around the world. Uh, this is a vital matter, and we urge you to share whatever you've learned with your colleagues. Thanks once again to everyone. Thanks to our sponsor, Novotel, and Lori, back to you. All right, thank you. And again, thank you all for joining us. This is Lori Dearman saying, hope we see you on the next one. Bye for now.